welcome everybody to another episode of Stories of S's. Um, I want to start off by saying that we are a little bit sorry that we have been a little bit inconsistent the last couple of weeks. Um, there have been a couple of schedule changes on our end. Um, and we're also working on something really big for you guys. Dun, dun, dun. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but Danny knows what it is. And Schmitty knows what it is. Yeah, I signed an NDA. <laughs> you can't, if you sign an NDA, you can't say you signed an NDA. You say, I cannot disclose anything at the time. Mm. You can't even acknowledge that an NDA exists. Okay. Yeah, we did. We do have something really big coming up. And we're just really excited. We hope everyone has had a great start to February. And we're already in month two. And. And. Taylor Swift announced that she's dropping a new album in April. Guys, that's my birth month. The last time she dropped something on my birthday was me from a bomb. She dropped it on April 26th. And I love that for her. Important facts about Gabby. Mm -hmm. I will I will never not bring it back to Taylor. I'm really excited for her. New music. And uh, yeah, that's the intro to the stories of us is today, everyone. Danny, how are you doing? I'm doing good. I just in a little bit of back pain, so I feel like an old man. And Danny did RDLs the wrong way, so he is now hurting with some baby back pain. Yeah, but just because Gabby talked me into it, I don't usually do that you're sure. supposed to do it the oh well, you didn't do it the correct way you're supposed to do it the way i showed you this morning mm. anyway i'm going to stick with the kettlebells anyway he's just a big baby but we'll get him back on those booty gains for sure um so this week's episode uh we're going back into greek mythology we hear you it's like your favorite subject so we'll bring it back uh Danny, do you know who we're talking about today? I know who we're talking about today. It's Hera, the queen of the gods. Yes. Which is kind of weird to me. How is like how do gods have a queen? But I guess you will elaborate on that. Yes, I will. Kind of. Kind of. Well, today's resources are classicalwisdom.com, mythopedia.com, theoi.com, thecollector.com, and a paper by Mara Wood called Feminist Icons Wanted. Um, I'm really excited to talk about that. So, let's begin. The tale of Hera unfolds with a complexity that mirrors the divine intricacies of Olympus. Hera, born to the titans Cronus and Rhea, emerge from the cosmic echoes of a time when titans overthrew primordial deities to establish their reign. Among her siblings were illustrious gods like Hestia, Demeter, Hades, Poseidon, and Zeus, setting the stage for a familial drama that would resonate through the ages. Hera's union with Zeus, her brother, an eventual king of the gods, painted a saga of divine matrimony. Their offspring included Aletheia, Hebe, Hephaestus, and Ares, anchored the Olympian dynasty. Yet, the mythic narrative wove additional threads, connecting them to divine figures like Angelos, Eleutheria, Eris, the Charities, the Curities, and even the mighty Heracles. In the realm of marriage, Hera's fidelity stood in stark contrast to Zeus's polyamorous escapades. Mythic figures, including Ixion and Endymion, attempted to seduce her, adding tales of thwarted desires to her mythos. A lesser-known story whispered of a dark encounter with the giant Eurymedon, leading to a birth of Prometheus. Beyond her immediate offspring, Hera played the begrudging mother to some of Zeus's children from liaisons. <laughs> Nursing the likes of Heracles, Hermes, and Dionysus. As a foster mother, she cradled monsters like Typhius, the Nemean lion, 
Earth and the Hydra, unveiling the multifaceted nature of her maternal role. Hera's origins trace back to the earliest stratum of Greek deities, attested in the Mycenaean period. The evolution of her cult and its introduction to Greece remain shrouded in mystery, leaving us to ponder her potential independent worship before becoming Zeus's consort. Hera's birth, swallowed by her father Cronus in fear of a prophesied overthrow, resonates with the broader tale of the Titanomachy. There we go. This epic struggle saw Hera and her siblings defy the Titans, culminating in her ascent to the Mount Olympus queen with the Olympians. Hera's role in the Titanomachy remains elusive. Some traditions claim she was raised by Titans Oceanus and Tethys, distancing her from direct involvement in the war. Others tell of her upbringing by a nymph named Macris on the island of Euboea. The pursuit of Hera by Zeus after prior marriages to Met Metis and Themis becomes a pivotal chapter in their intricate relationship. Their grand, sacred marriage involved the moray officiating, Eros driving the wedding chariot, and Iris preparing the marital bed. Yet behind the splendor, their union was marred by hurt and infidelity. To answer Daniel's question, basically, Hera was popular on her own, and she is the goddess of marriage and childbirth and like motherhood. The animals that are associated with her are the peacock, the cow, the cuckoo, and um. She has a lot of involvement in just, like, home building. When it came for Zeus to pick a queen, right, because he was married before, the most popular one and the one with the most power was Hera from the perspective of being worshipped by the Greek people. However, they ruled because Zeus helped overthrow their dad, Cronus. So that's how he became a king. He like got rule. He got um picked as the ruler of everyone. Basically, they were like, "You did it. You saved us. You get to be king. Now you get to pick a queen." And he picked, I guess, his sister. Duh. <laughs> Duh. I didn't know he was from West Virginia. <laughs> I'm from Virginia, so I can make those jokes, okay? Um, yeah. So it was kind of like uh, because he was able to overcome the Titans that he was able to become king. And then he picked Hera as a queen. And then Zeus gave, like, he appointed who was who. So he appointed Poseidon as the god of the sea. And Hades, god of the underworld. And I guess their love story started very, like, normal. And then Zeus was Zeus. And decided to not be part of that marriage. And a lot of the myths surrounding Hera have to do with her being very jealous. Because, at least that's how they painted her out to be. Because of Zeus's infidelity. and. What's crazy to me is that in the stories, like the one we're about to read, is that they picture or they frame Hera to be the bad guy because she gets mad that her husband is being unfaithful. So let's go into the story, which many of you probably know, the story of Heracles. Heracles and Hera had a difficult relationship. In fact, the queen of the gods tremendously hated the half-man known for his strength and hero status, and really went out of her way to make his life as difficult as possible. Snubbing Heracles publicly would just not do. Hera wanted to make him suffer. It all started before Heracles, Hercules in Latin, was born. The bastard was the result of one of Zeus's many affairs, this time with a mortal woman named Alcmene. The god of the sky disguised himself as this poor woman's husband in order to make love to her and consequently impregnated her. 
In fact, her actual groom came home later that night, and Alcmini also became pregnant with his son at the same time. It was technically a case of heteropaternal superfecundation, where a human woman carries twins sired by different fathers. Is that a real thing, no? That is a real thing. What? No a, way. It's but a that real can thing. happen, like, naturally? That happens naturally. Wow. Yeah, sometimes it just happens. Zeus's adultery was the sole reason for Hera's unending wrath against the unfortunate Heracles. Hera did everything she could to stop Heracles and his brother from ever even existing. She forced Alithia, goddess of childbirth, to sit cross-legged with knotted clothing to hinder their very entry into the world. Hera might have permanently denied the children's lives if the mother's servant had enfolded the goddess of childbirth. The quick-witted help convinced Alithia that the babies had already been born. Seeing her task as pointless, the goddess jumped up, undid the knots, and allowed the birth of the twins to proceed. After this, Heracles' mother was worried about Hera. She might enact revenge. So Alcmene exposed her half-god child, who was taken up by Athena to see Hera. Zeus's wife did not recognize her many mortal enemy, and inadvertently nursed him out of pity. The super-strong infant, however, suckled so intensely that Hera pushed him away due to pain. Her milk then sprayed across the sky, forming the Milky Way. Heracles, meanwhile, acquired supernatural powers from the divine milk and was returned to his mother. Despite her accidental gift, Hera was still on a warpath. She went down two enormous serpents. She sent down two enormous serpents to the baby's crib so she might be rid of them. Unlike his twin brother, Heracles was not afraid and grabbed the reptiles. His parents found him happily babbling away in baby gibberish, holding the strangled snakes as if they were toys. Heracles' strength and partial divinity was confirmed by the act. The young boy then grew into a huge, powerful, and courageous man that legends are made of. Sure, he killed his music teacher with a liar, but overall, he was destined for greatness. He killed his music teacher with what? A liar. It's like a mini version of a harp. Oh, uh, yeah. That's funny. And who was his brother? I don't know. You don't know? Uh, Heracles' twin? Twinsies. Twinsies. He was prophesized an unusual future, full of vanquishing monsters and making myths. Heracles then moved to Thebes, where he married King Creon's daughter, Megara, and started a family. Unfortunately, at this moment, Hera stepped back into Heracles' life. She drove him so mad that he murdered all of his children, and maybe even his wife as well. After being cured of his temporary insanity, he fled to the Oracle oracle of delphi to search for a way to expiate his sins even this attempt was foiled by his arch enemy who guided the oracle to punish heracles further he was ordered to serve king eurystheus a man he knew was lesser than him and do whatever was asked of him for the following 10 years it was during this time that heracles completed his famous 12 labors he was actually only supposed to do ten, but the king cheated him into doing two more. Apparently, a few of his miraculous monster-killing acts were not up to scratch because he either received money or help. Heracles was purged of infanticide. He joined a superhero group called the Argonauts. Bum, bum, bum. I feel like I have heard that name before. You have heard that name before? Remind me. No. That's for another podcast. Okay. Okay. <laughs> they searched for the Golden Fleece, conquered Troy, fought against the gigantes, uh, gigantes, and of course, rescued heroines. During one such escapade, Heracles fell in love with Princess Lola of Ocalia, an ancient Greek city. In legend, like fashion, her father, King Eurystheus promised his daughter to whomever could win an archery competition against his sons. Heracles promptly triumphed, but the king did not fulfill his promise of giving away his daughter. Instead, the king and all his sons, except one named Iphthus, spurned Heracles. The demigod then proceeded to kill them all, except Iphthus, who became his BFF. That's right. Enter heartless Hera once more. 
She again drove Heracles mad, and this time the hefty beast of man threw his greatest pal over the city wall to his death, the one he just let live. Wow. And just like the last time, Heracles submitted to servitude as a penalty for the killing. The epitome of all things masculine, Heracles then spent the next three years doing women's work in women's clothes. His new master, Queen of Valley of Lydia, modern-day Turkey, completed the farce by donning Heracles' iconic club and lion skin garb. Eventually, the queen freed Heracles and married him. Over the years, Heracles continued to have extraordinary adventures. He rescued poor Prometheus from a vulture that ate his liver every day. He killed countless beasts, dragons, and monsters. He had a drinking contest with Dionysus and lost. He founded a new nation in Scythia by having relations with a half-woman, half-snake. In addition to all the warring, Heracles managed to have endless affairs with women and men, fathering countless children and heirs, and thereby passing on his strength and partial divinity for many, many years. Kings for ages would boast lineage from the demigod. Eventually, though, these extramarital affairs were the end of Heracles. It all happened with Heracles and his third wife, Dianera, tried to cross a river. A centaur named Nessus offered to help the young lady, but then tried to take advantage of her while Heracles was on shore. The mighty warrior was not pleased and swiftly shot the deceitful centaur. As Nessus lay lying, however, he plotted his revenge. He told Heracles' wife that she should gather up his blood and spilled semen in order to prevent her husband from being unfaithful. All she had to do was apply his poison fluids to Heracles' clothes. Eventually, when Dinera suspected that Heracles was enamored with Lola, the one with the dishonest father, she inadvertently followed through with Ness's lethal plan. She soaked Hercules' clothes in the blood and gave the item to his servant to deliver to him. Heracles put it on and was immediately in torment. The poison burned the flesh from his bones, and Heracles then sh- chose to die in a pyre to end his suffering. After the flames ate away at his immortal body, all that remained was a mortal and divine entity. He then became a full god, joined his father on Mount Olympus, and married his fourth and final wife, Hebe, which is Hera and Zeus's daughter. Heracles was then living upstairs on the mountaintop with Hera and the goddess who unsuccessfully tried to kill and torture him. Her Herculean efforts to ruin him all failed, and in the end, Hercules was killed by the tree Hera hated so much. Infidelity. And that is the tumultuous tale of Hercules and Hera, written by Anna Leonard. So, when I read this story, I think of how is Hera portrayed? Mm -hmm. Which is what this podcast is about, is talking about, like, the characters and how they're portrayed, specifically the women characters in these stories. And I have to say that she really, the way Hera lives, one of the things that she does every year, according to her mythos, is that every year she bathes in the spring and she regains her virginity. Even though she only has one husband... She doesn't have any extramarital affairs. They, her stories, they make her regain her virginity so that she doesn't lose her power, right? So what is that message sending to girls and women when they hear that the only way that the queen of the gods has power isn't through what she does or like her position as queen, but the fact that she regains her virginity it sounds a bit like puritanical and controlling right i agree it's i guess it's to a certain point like related to the fact that she's also the queen of like birth and stuff but i mean of like mother like the motherhood but wouldn't necessarily have to be the virginity right and then the other portion is is that if you put yourself in her shoes you are a very powerful woman You are forced to basically marry your brother. You are not given the freedom fully of being a a partner that is faithful to you, right? Like, she doesn't have that. She has a partner who is always unfaithful, always commits infidelity, 
in the most like weird way is like Zeus turns into coins, he turns into a goose, he turns into someone else's husband, like, and he like forcibly without consent a lot of the times has these women sleep with him and have his kids. And as a goddess of motherhood and, you know, marriage, it is just so hard to to see that right and then further that is that you see those children of your husband committing the same things over and over and over again that you hate and as a goddess of marriage of course you're gonna hate infidelity and why shouldn't she be upset and jealous and mad yeah i agree i mean I guess that's what marriage stands for nowadays. I don't really know how the how the Greek marriage was defined, but if you are married to someone, then you are not supposed to go out. But I mean, like, whatever. even then, like, they, you know, focus solely on monogamy and not so much on polyamory, right? And I think that when you're in a relationship and you agree to polyamory, like, that's one thing. But when you agree to monogamy and then you do the opposite, that's another thing. Yeah, that's true. But I think for Zeus, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, like he's the god and he's the character. So he gets away with like doing whatever he wants to do. But that's the thing, like he shouldn't because none, like when we read these myths, we're kind of like, oh, yeah, Zeus did that. Keep on reading, blah, blah, blah. Mm. But when goddesses do that and like, do something i would say fucked up it's like unacceptable and that's like something that you know i think we talked about in a previous episode is that in a lot of these stories the men the male characters are allowed to mess up they're allowed to f up right but not the women characters like the the women characters have these archetypes to fit in right the virgin the mother the whore yeah, what just came to my mind is who wrote those stories down, right? I mean, if they've been written down by a man and it has been influenced by the view of society from back then, that's what I would put in as like the options. Exactly. Right? Exactly. But then you also see how that translates still to today. I mean, for example... The way a lot of people view the Judeo-Christian God has a lot of influence by Zeus. That he's going to strike you with a bolt of lightning if you enter a church and you're sinning. He has this like long white beard and he's sitting in the clouds. Like that imagery is based on Greek mythology. That is not based on Judeo-Christian. Wait, no, no, no. You got that wrong. You know what it's based on? It's actually based on Santa Claus. It's not based on Santa Claus. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay, no, I'm joking. You're such a silly goose. Oh my god. But yeah, like there, there's that imagery that you know that not just prevails through stories, but also through images, through um. Greek mythology through then what the Romans adopted from the Greeks, which is a lot of what is influenced um, through like Roman Catholicism. It's popping. It's super popular um, through for hundreds and hundreds of years. So for us to say, well, like that's how it was back then, not necessarily now. It's like, right. But our society now is based and formed by a lot of that influence that has come down for hundreds and hundreds of years. So, in the paper that I picked for this week, they talk about how Hera's unyielding refusal to be silenced within the Olympian pantheon offers a nuanced and compelling narrative that resonates deeply with women. As the queen of Olympian gods in Greek mythology, Hera's story goes beyond the traditional portrayal of her as the wife of Zeus and the goddess of marriage. Her strength, resilience, and assertiveness in the face of adversity elevate her to the status of a timeless icon, providing 
valuable lessons for women navigating challenges in various aspects of their lives. One of the most remarkable aspects of Hera's character is her unwavering commitment to protecting the sanctity of marriage. This girl goes all out. She's like, I have one job, and that's what I'm going to do. While some interpretations might cast her actions as fueled by jealousy, a woman's perspective allows us to see Hera as a guardian of women's rights within the context of marriage. In a society where women often had limited agency, Hera used her influence to ensure the well-being and rights of married women. By standing up for fidelity and the sacredness of the marital bond, Hera becomes a symbol of female agency and empowerment, right? Like, you deserve respect from your partner. Yeah. And so you cannot just take it lying down. If you, like, I think I read this in the Britney Spears book, Madonna said, you get what you negotiate for. If you don't negotiate for respect... You're not going to get it, even though it should be already what you get, period. Like, everybody deserves respect. You also have to, like, push and not be silent about it and not be, like, this, like, tame little flower that's like, well, I guess if you're going to give me respect, go for it. Like, no, there are times for you to be that way and there are times for you to be bold. And respect is not something that you need to ever compromise for. You never compromise respect. So Hera's resilience in the face of adversity is another aspect that aligns with women ideals. Despite facing numerous betrayals and challenges, she remains steadfast in her commitment to her own values and principles. Hera's ability to endure and overcome challenges demonstrates a strength that women can draw upon in their own lives. In a world where women have historically been subjected to various forms of oppression, Hera's resilience serves as a powerful example of how women can navigate adversity and emerge stronger. Furthermore, Hera's role as a protector of women during childbirth adds another layer to her feminist identity. In ancient Greece, childbirth was a perilous and challenging experience for women, and having a goddess like Hera to oversee and safeguard the process provided a sense of comfort and support. By championing the well-being of women in this vulnerable state, Hera can be seen as an advocate for the physical and emotional welfare of her female worshippers. However, perhaps one of the most striking aspects of Hera's character is her refusal to be silenced within the patriarchal structures of the Olympian pantheon. In a society where the voices of women were often marginalized, Hera consistently demonstrated that she would not conform to the expectations placed upon her as a woman and a wife. This defiance is evident in the response to Zeus's infidelity, where she vocalized her displeasure and on occasion took decisive action against those involved. Going back to like the story of Heracles, she wasn't going to be like, well, I guess. She was like, no, this is wrong. And she took action. Hera's willingness to speak out against injustice challenges the traditional narrative that expected wives to endure such behavior silently. Her refusal to be silenced becomes a powerful assertion of her own agency and autonomy within male-dominated pantheon. When faced with the most powerful deity in the Olympian hierarchy, Hera vocalized her dissent and actively opposed Zeus's plans, showcasing boldness that aligns with feminist principles. I mean, she didn't just stand up to him as a husband. She stood up to him as a king. She was like, that's wrong. That's not how we do things. That's unjust. That's unfair. Granted, I'm not saying, you know, like, try to commit infanticide with a baby. But I am saying that, like, Hera shows her displeasure. And she wasn't just going to accept anything from her husband or from her king if she didn't agree with it and if it didn't align with her principles. Moreover, Hera's interactions with other gods and goddesses further highlight her determination to be heard. In myths, where she disagreed with the decisions of Zeus or clashed with fellow deities, she did not hesitate to express her opinions and advocate for her perspective. This assertiveness challenges the submissive role often assigned to goddesses and underscores Hera's commitment to shaping her own destiny. Hera's association with marriage, traditionally seen as a realm of which women were expected to be passive 
actually empowered her to influence the lives of mortal women. As a goddess of marriage, she took an active interest in the well-being of wives and mothers, extending beyond her personal grievances with Zeus. This broader commitment positions Hera as a figure who actively shapes and defends the rights of women, challenging the notion that women should remain silent in matters of family and marriage. And Hera was like, over my dead goddess body. Yeah, she was basically not accepting what is going on. And I think that's uh, right. And she did it in a good way. So never back up, never back down. Never surrender. In the face of adversity, Hera's vocal opposition and refusal to be silenced became integral aspects of her feminist identity. Her story serves as a poignant reminder of the importance for women to assert their voices, challenge oppressive norms, and advocate for their rights. As we have delved into Hera's narrative, it becomes evident that her legacy extends far beyond the realms of mythology. It carries a profound message that transcends time and resonates with contemporary discussions around gender equality. We can draw inspiration from Hera's legacy. We are reminded of the collective strength that arises when women refuse to tolerate disrespect. It becomes a rallying cry for all women to embrace their inherent power, reject silence in the face of adversity, and demand the respect they deserve. Hera's story serves as a testament to the enduring truth that empowerment lies not in conformity, but in the courageous refusal to be silenced. Mm, that's right. Like you gotta insist on it, and you gotta keep going. Otherwise, you can like, never take point. no for an answer. Yeah. Otherwise, you will just end up like broken. Right. Like, like, and by that I mean like when you know that you need something, when you know that you deserve something, when you have the right to something. When people tell you no, that's not a good answer. Yeah. In the tapestry of women's history, Hera's narrative stands as a powerful reminder that every woman has the right to be heard, respected, and value. It encourages women to forge their own paths, challenge societal expectations, and contribute to the ongoing narrative of empowerment. Through Hera's example, we are inspired to create a world where women never accept disrespect, where their voices resound with strength and where the echoes of empowerment reverberate for generations to come. Hera's refusal to be science is not merely a chapter in mythology, but a timeless lesson for women to stand firm, speak out, and never allow their voices to be stifled. I mean, she's such an example. You know, she is such a mother figure. I mean, she's fostering gods. She's fostering monsters. She's fostering half uh, gods like demigods she took her role as her primary principle mm -hmm. right that what her role is is what she stood for right and she also has a step down with her behavior mm -hmm. yeah you know and so many people like so many other goddesses wouldn't have done what she did or wouldn't have like the the courage to be so pleasantly disrespectful <laughs> to men disrespecting her to men silencing her um to people passing on the stories that she's like some mad woman she's not a woman who demands respect is not mad a woman who demands respect is a woman period there's nothing wrong with her she's not crazy she deserves it yeah, as everyone. Everyone deserves the respect and Exactly, absolutely. Irrespective of who they are. Yeah. And I think that Hera's reminder to women is that no matter who you're surrounded with, no matter if they're above you or if they're more powerful than you are, like that does not excuse them um for being bad, right? Just because you're more powerful, that does not excuse you for being a bad person. Yeah, or for treating someone bad. I or for treating someone badly, so. Yeah. Can you believe that we just scratched the surface of the world of Hera? Just the surface? Just the oh surface. Oh my god, yeah. I mean, she had so many kids. We had like a whole story about Heracles. I'm quite sure there's more to come. And that wasn't even her kid. <laughs> True. So. I do want to say that 
Hera's pop culture glow up is in one of my favorite comics. And I've been reading it for, I think, since we've met. Oh, yeah, I I know the comic. I don't know if it's just about Greek mythology. or It if is. It's, yeah, it it's is. only about that. Um, on yeah. the perspective of Persephone and Hades, it's called Lore Olympus. It's by Rachel Smith. She's a New Zealand artist. And seriously, if you haven't checked it out, you're missing out on a modern spin that takes Hera to a whole new level. She's not just the goddess of marriage, but this is like a modern take where you see her navigating life, relationships, and empowerment in the most relatable way possible. So big shout out to Rachel Smith for giving Hera the spotlight she deserves in Lore Olympus. It's fantastic to see ancient myths getting a fresh and clever makeover. Before we sign off, I want to say a massive thank you to all of you for hanging out and nerding out with us. If you enjoyed the podcast, do the cool thing and hit subscribe, drop a five-star rating, or leave a incredible review. Your feedback helps us with episodes and it keeps the podcast train rolling. Thank you guys for being here today. We really appreciate it. And make sure you guys follow us on Instagram, on YouTube, and wherever else we are. Yeah, uh, we will be um, updating all of our socials in the next couple of weeks to come. Like I said, we do have something pretty cool to roll out in a couple of weeks. So thank you all so much. Stay tuned for more stories of S's and remember to channel your inner Hera. Refuse to be silence, demand respect, and keep rocking your story. <laughs> keep rocking. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Have a good evening or a good day or a good morning, wherever you are. Bye, guys. Bye.